Life is uh, it's expensive. It doesn't it doesn't stop. It's like the river, right? The river just keeps flowing and keeps flowing and doesn't stop. The next month, the next you know month's mortgage or rent or car payment or insurance payment or everything is you know is always there. But I really believe that you can have a really good musical career on the side, right? You really can. And then at the right time, once you've got your million dollar house paid off and you know you don't have a lot of you know, you've got some savings and you've got whatever it is. And now all of a sudden your kids are a little bit older. You can say, hey, I'm going to devote more time to music. Well, welcome to the podcast today. Uh, my special guest is my friend John Cheney, uh, a fellow whitewater kayaker and piano player uh, who has also had a business career that is is not your normal path for a musician. And I, th I think, John, I'm excited to have you here because you've really you've been super successful in the tech and the the uh, just in the business world. Um, with your companies you've had, yet you have done, I mean, you've done some amazing recordings as well and are continuing to to grow on that. So welcome to the show. Thanks so much, Jason. Really excited to be here. So John, let's let's dive in. I, I, I love your journey that you've had as a musician. Maybe start us back of when you were starting playing piano and, you know, you didn't have that normal, or I guess what people, a lot of people would call normal musician path to to have a music career so start us out i guess as a kid when you started playing piano and how did you get to where you are today yeah yeah thanks for the for the intro here so um i started playing piano you know as most people do just tinkering around on the piano at home and my parents um had a they they really believe in the power of music in the home and you know the just the power that that could bring into a home and the spirit it can bring into a home. And, uh, you know, when I, I was born in Houston and when I was about, I don't know, two years old, probably my parents bought a, bought a piano. And this was before they had a, uh, bed frame. They just had the box springs and the mattress. Right. And it was a comfortable home, whatever. Right. My, my dad had a good job. He was very successful, but, but very early in his career and, and he, you know, he bought this nice Yamaha G7 or something, you know, that plenty good, just baby grand, but, um, but still sits in their home today. And I love playing it. It's my, it's my home piano. Right. Mm -hmm. But, um, but yeah, started playing when I was, I don't know, three or four years old and then didn't actually officially start taking piano lessons until I was about seven. And, uh, I picked up very quickly. Uh, my teacher was pretty good at, uh, you know, kind of just pretty standard, you know, going through the basics. Right. But then one thing that she encouraged me to do a lot of, which I tended to really like was sight reading. Right. She really wanted me to just, she didn't care about me mastering a song quite as much as, you know, we, we did sometimes, right. We had the recital songs and I'd master those whatever pieces and, but, but she would just be like, it's good enough. Let's go to the next one. Good enough. And sometimes we would go in a lesson we'd go to the next song in the book and I would play it. She'd say, you know what? I don't think you need to practice that for a week. Could you practice it and get better at it? Yes. But let's move to the next one until I run into something that's a little bit harder where she said, Oh, you kind of stumbled here. Why don't you practice on that? And then we'll come back. Right. And so I got really good at sight reading and, um, and that opened up lots of opportunities, obviously. And uh, I took lessons till I was about 12 years old. And then my dad got called away as a, as a mission president for our church um, when I was 12 years old down to Paraguay. And so moved down there and, and from age 12 to 15, I had no, no piano teacher, no nothing, but my piano teacher had given me a great foundation of this sight reading. And so I could just open up when we brought tons of piano books and there was a music store down there where we could buy music and, and, um, and I really enjoyed playing movie music. That was something that I really loved. And so I'd buy everything that I could and just play everything that I could. Um, I then in, uh, in middle school while I was down there in Paraguay got introduced to jazz, right. And, and, uh, joined the jazz band and jazz opened up a whole new level where all of a sudden it wasn't about sight reading. It was about taking the music away and saying, Hey, here's a few letters and numbers. See if you can make something up that sounds good. Um, and I had to learn a little bit more about theory and, 
and different chord progressions and things like that. And, and, uh, and that obviously, I think that sight reading and being able to quickly kind of do something and fill in the gaps as well as that jazz and improvisation background led to me being able to start composing at about age 15. Um, so kind of right as I came back, I would say even maybe 16, I kind of got, uh, I got hooked up with, uh, John Schmidt's brother, actually, um, uh, sorry, not brother, cousin, um, his cousin. And, um, and he, he kind of sat down with me for, I think he did a total of three lessons. <laughs> he went to my parents and said, I don't have anything else to teach him right now. Um, he should just play. Right. And so I, it was kind of at that, I always knew that I could, I was above average and I could do stuff you know, very easily on the piano, but it was then that I started to really say, okay, Hey, um, maybe, maybe I can do a little bit more. And I started composing at about age 16 and, uh, here I am 20 years later and still doing it. Still doing it for fun. But it, so your, your college career, um, with going to school, did you study music at all or you went into a whole nother area? Yeah. So I, when I went to BYU, my dad had done, as I mentioned, very well in for himself in life. And so I said, Hey, why not do the same thing? He was an accountant by a uh, major and then he was an MBA. And so he never actually did accounting in his career. Um, but, uh, but I said, Hey, you know what? I'll learn some it's good business skills. I'll learn accounting and do an MBA. And I got into at BYU into the accounting, you know, first, the first class, you know, the pre-business, whatever. And, um, uh, was by uh, it was taught by a guy named ne Norm Nemro, really cool guy, um, and he thoroughly and very quickly convinced me that I didn't want to do accounting. <laughs> not by actually telling me that, but just sitting in his lectures, I'm like, this is not for me, right? And so I actually transitioned to a music major at BYU and said, hey, this is cool. And so I started, I started going to you know different classes, and I got through maybe four or five classes there. And, uh, and said, you know what, don't really love the way that this is pushing me, right? It was pushing me more towards like piano performance and yeah, they had some composing and things like that, but it just wasn't interesting to me. And I didn't like the kind of ways that they were wanting me to play and do stuff. And so I was just like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to do this on my own. And, uh, it was that, that point I went on a mission and came back after that and, I served in Taiwan and I came back and I said, okay, what's the fastest way for me to get out of college? <laughs> right. But while still getting my degree. And that was, that was Chinese. Right. Um, Cause I could test out of a bunch and I had a bunch of AP credits from high school. And so about two hard, you know, hard years of uh, work and, and I was done, done with that. Um, I've always been an entrepreneur. I've always been from, uh, from an early age uh, you know, even when I was, eight years old selling door to door, you know, mistletoe that I would go and cut off the trees in Houston. And, um, and so I knew that I, 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 I knew that I wanted to be able to have control over my income control over how I, um, could support my family and music to me didn't feel like number one, I, I kind of had this experience, like I mentioned at BYU that was, you know, I didn't like being told what to do, I guess, if that's, if that makes sense. That makes total sense. And, and then I did, I actually did some composing for like some commercials and things like that. And, you know, a little, whatever. I still didn't like being told what to do by those people. Right. Cause they, I, I write this beautiful thing and they'd be like, I don't like it. I'd be like, but it's awesome. You know? And anyway, so I kind of quickly became a little disenamored with that, with that side of it. And uh, at least, at least, for that moment. Um, I think I've grown a lot since then and, and I'm more collaborative probably than I am, than I was. And, uh, but I really realized that in order for me to, to be able to live the comfortable lifestyle that I had grown up with, it wasn't going to be, you know, writing music for commercials and, and doing that music pathway. And so I, I made a very conscious decision to say, okay, I'm going to start businesses. I'm, I'm a business guy. I'm an entrepreneur. I'm going to do that. And I'm going to keep music just as a side thing. And, uh, and throughout the years I've published, you know, six or seven albums and, you know, I, I play and perform whenever I get a chance. And I've had some times where I'm doing it more than others. Um, but, um, uh, but I really, I, I always find myself <laughs> sitting at the piano, whether it's at my keyboard here next to my computer or, um, you know, at my grand piano or whatever. And I'm just like, man, this is. I really enjoy this. I wish I could do this, you know, more. I really like, I really enjoy composing. That's something that I think 
probably challenges my entrepreneur mind because an entrepreneur has to be able to do a lot of things at once to you know put all the pieces together. You know this, Jason. Oh yeah. Because you are you are the same, right? But you've got to be able to do the sales and the marketing and the product design and the customer feedback and send the contracts and collect the money, whatever, right? You got to do everything, right? Until it gets big enough to where you can hire other people to help. Um, and so, you know, I think orchestration is fun because you get to create the melody and then all the counterpoint and all the different things, the bass, and then all the frills and thrills that go along with a good, fun composition. And uh, and so I've enjoyed doing that a lot more lately and, um, and really have, I really have a desire down the road to do, um, to do a motion picture. I think that would be really fun. Very cool. So I, where you've been in that business entrepreneur path for, for several years, I mean, more than probably almost 20 years now, you're probably getting up in there, but, um, uh, what, as you look at other musicians, cause I know you've got other friends that have been musicians and, and know a lot of people, what, what are some of the pitfalls you see that musicians typically have, um, that if they'd had that business background, it would have been made their life a little easier and getting their music out there. Yeah, I think I don't know a lot of rich musicians, right? Obviously there are some, right? Mm -hmm. One Republic, Imagine Dragons, you know, they're making a lot of money, oh, yeah. but unless you're a big rock band, pop band, K-pop band, whatever you are, right? Um, unless you hit it big, which is almost impossible to plan, right? You, th there's absolutely, just like in entrepreneurship, those that hit it big, there's a huge element of luck and you have to be prepared. You have to do your, your you know, put in your time and all of that. But ultimately, um, it's really, really hard to make money. I know very good musicians at, at all levels, whether they're just an individual performer, a composer, um, a songwriter, whatever it is, and they do fine. They make enough to, you know, make 80 grand a year, 60 grand a year, 100 grand a year, maybe even a little bit more than that to, uh, you know, they can provide for their family. They can provide for their family, but you're never going to get ahead in life making 100 grand a year, right? Um, if you want to go on nice vacations and, um, you know, have the freedom to buy the nicest instrument, you know, I'm, I'm right now, finishing a purchase of a $250,000 piano. And I'm very grateful for that, but it's also a 20 years of entrepreneurship, of crazy blood, sweat, and tears to be able to have the potential to even do that. Right. And musicians that are much better than me can look at that piano and say, Hey, wow, I could do so much with that thing. Right. And yeah, I, I get it. I've been, I've been there um, for many years and, um, but it but it takes it takes something more than the music to be able to make the music possible. I think I think a lot of people, and I think the pathway that I'm that I got okay with was, hey, I'm going to make this a hobby. I'm going to still do it a lot, and I'm going to try to put out an album every year or two. And um, you know, lately I've been putting out Christmas stuff every Christmas and things like that. And and um, and and maybe accelerating a little bit on the on the composing front but but it took years of saying hey all right first i'm going to just really set my family up well so that they're comfortable and i can send my kids to gymnastics and my wife can buy a horse if she wants to and be able to a horse isn't cheap but the really expensive thing is paying for the barn and the feed and maintaining it and all everything boarding it or whatever it is you have to do life is uh it's expensive it doesn't it doesn't stop it's like the river right uh, the river just keeps flowing and keeps flowing and doesn't doesn't stop the next month, the next uh, you know month's mortgage or rent or car payment or insurance payment or everything is um, you know is always there. But but I really believe that um, that you can have a really uh, good musical career on the side, right? You really can, and then you know if if that's what you really want to focus on. Um, and then at the right time, once you've got your million dollar house paid off and, you know, you don't have a lot of, you know, and you've got some savings and you've got whatever it is. And now all of a sudden your kids are a little bit older. You can say, Hey, I'm going to devote more time to music. Um, I've also, I've also thought more from a, and this is maybe more of a spiritual perspective, but there's going to be a lot of time for us to do the things that we want to do. Right. Um, and I, I personally believe we'll have we'll have the ability to do those things 
um, after this life. And, and so I'm not saying not to do it now, but, um, but don't feel like you have to cram everything into now. I think that's what I'm trying to say. I, I am, I do a ton of things. I, um, I mentioned this even at our concert the other night. I love, you know, I've, I've got, you know, several business ventures that are going on and that's crazy. I, I love playing the piano. I love whitewater kayaking. I love mountain biking. I love, I actually live on a farm and it's insanely busy and you know, just taking care of, you know, making sure everything stays alive and well, and then killing the weeds that aren't supposed to be alive and everything else. But it's just a massive amount of work. Like I could, I could spend eight hours a day and not finish, you know, all week long and not finish everything I need to do on the farm and do that all summer long. So I just have lots of competing priorities and I want to have 70 hours a day. I really, I've said that to my wife a hundred times. I wish I had 70 hours in a day so that I get everything done. I want to, but you really just have to say, Hey, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to try to have some balance here. Um, and, and, and by the way, another thing that I didn't mention that's extremely important is I have four kids and a wife that want to see me and hang out with me. Right. And so there's a, you know, a time and a season for every purpose under heaven, right? There's, there's a, I think you just have to, to find the balance that you're okay with. Um, now, some people are going to be pulled to say, Hey, you know what? I need to do music right now. And Oh my gosh, I'm going to cheer you on and go do it. And you're, what you're going to do is you're going to say, Hey, you know what? I'm going to do music full time and I'm going to delay maybe the house or those vacations or, you know, some of the other things I'm talking about. And you're just going to really focus on that because that's what makes you happy. And ultimately, I think that's what you should, that's your guide, right? What makes you right. go to bed at night and say, I'm comfortable with my life. I'm happy. Well, and I, I, I know lots and lots of musician, musicians as well. And oftentimes they, they go all in and they're excited, but, you know, it takes, they spend a year or two years, or even five years. And sometimes it doesn't take off for them. And I think the hard part is, is continuing to, show back up, get up to the plate again, um, get up at bat and do another album, do another album. And, but I, I think sometimes the experiences we gain in the business or, I mean, you've, you've done a whole bunch of entrepreneur stuff and done multi-million dollar companies. I've had that same path. I mean, I worked in banking then I had a software company and consulting company and the things that I learned in running a business, actually, I, I know for a fact have made me much more successful in launching my albums and, and, and just even when I go into the studio, I, if I know I have this limited amount of time, it's like, okay, I got two days to get into the studio. I mean, some artists will spend a full week knocking out a song and, and they, they thrive on that creative process and they'll spend, you know, thousands of dollars doing that. And even I think when, when you or I, if we could pay thousands of dollars and ha the problem is we don't have the time, I can't go spend, you know, two weeks straight, hardly ever mm -mm. in a studio to, to go be creative and, and as fun as that would be, it's just not realistic. Yeah. But I, I think every, go ahead. I'm sorry, I was just gonna say every album I've ever uh recorded has been done in a four hour session. The end. That's crazy. Done. And sometimes it's two hours if I just nail it, right? Mm -hmm. I'm pretty clean on the piano. I sit down and I can just kind of knock it out, right? But um but yeah, I don't you're right. I, I can't even imagine spending two weeks. I think it would be a blast to spend oh, yeah. two weeks nailing it and then bringing in the other instruments there. I mean, sometimes I'm like, I got an idea. I'm going to throw it down and I'm going to publish it and I'm going to move on to the next thing and check that thing off my goal list. That's massive and ambitious. And then I'm going to get back to whatever emails I need to be sending off. But, and I, and just the same in business when you have all these things going, you have to prioritize those specific things. So if it's the song, I think being as a musician, being able to recognize, okay, I got two hours or four hours or whatever it is, maybe, Maybe you're going to be able to do a four-hour album, uh, but think what would happen is the quality, and you balance that quality versus you know limited amount of time. If you did spend, maybe you increase that to eight hours. Does your recording get that much more better, and does it pay off? And it eventually, you know, if you're spending two weeks, probably isn't worth it. But uh, the other thing I see musicians make mistakes on all the time is they they have all these ideas, and you know, it sounds great, but. They can't ship a product. Uh, Seth Godin, I don't know if you follow him or not, but um, he talks about the importance of shipping a product. I mean, eventually, out the door. as an entrepreneur, you've got to be able to, you've you've kind of got this baby you've been working on for this business and there's a product. And if you can't ever ship a product, it doesn't matter how cool your business is or how cool your song is, it's, it's not going to ever matter because you never get things done. And I, I know 
kind of musicians, that creative mind oftentimes struggles with getting getting crap done and being able to say, okay. You want to get it right. Yeah, right. You get vision and it's got to like come out exactly like well, that. Well, and there's, there's, I think there's a difference between get it right and get it perfect. Yeah. And with products, there's, you know, we, we, so, you know, that, that journey is you're figuring out what's right at the time or perfect and it's never going to be perfect. The more you learn and the more your customers change and the more your listeners and fans change, that's going to continue to evolve and, you know, being okay with shipping that thing as it is now that you've put your energy in and being able to recognize, yep, it's time to, I got to ship this. It doesn't matter. You know, yes. Could it get better if I spend another 10 hours on it? Sure. But is it worth the time? Uh, yeah. And, uh, yeah. It's, it's crazy. When I look at my top songs on Spotify, um, they're the ones that I, I swear almost all of them are the ones that I just winged in the studio and I did it one, you know, one take, done right and then people are like hey can i can you get me the sheet music for this and i'm like yeah i'll have to figure it out <laughs> write it down you know but um but it's yeah it's it's interesting how um you know we spend a lot of time trying to really nail it down and the reality is most people can't tell uh, most people are just looking for some good music to go in the background the other thing that's crazy about spotify i saw this interesting stat the other day every single day there are sixty thousand new songs on Spotify. And I don't want to get off on this tangent too much, but 14% of those as of today are made by AI. Well, I, I heard it was a hundred thousand on something that I just read yesterday, actually. Yeah. And I, and I, I don't actually, know which number is true, but I'm sure there's some big crazy number that I read that hundred thousand number. And I was like, that seems high. And then I went and I looked it up and I found 60,000. So it's between 60 and a hundred, let's say way, way too many <laughs> crazy. So then you go and you spend two weeks or two hours in the studio and you knock out 10 songs and you're this tiny fraction of, you know, this massive release of just that day and you're trying to get to stand out. And so this is where business starts to come in handy, right? You have to know how to stand out amongst billions of people um, and thousands of companies, hundreds of thousands of services out there trying to compete with you. And so learning how to do ads and how to, you know, make sure you're not losing money by spending too much on leads and, and how to, you know, even if you do spend a lot of money on those leads in the beginning, how to then leverage those over time and build lists. And, and, you know, you've done a lot of this, of course, with your, uh, you know, with your piano books and your music and career. And, and, um, and that's fantastic. I've done it some more heavily at, at different times. And, uh, but it's, it's like, that's the easy part. For me, I think, right? When I'm just like, hey, I need to I need to push this and I want to sell a hundred piano books. Okay, I can do that. All I have to do is just go into business mode for a moment, sell the music and do that. A lot of people are great musicians and they have no idea how to get it out there. Now there's obviously, you know, TikTok and Snapchat and Instagram and different things like that these days that um kind of a different style of getting music out there. I've never really done that in a big way. Um, mm -hmm. I kind of have the channels and I is terrible at really focusing on them because I just have so many competing things in my mind. Um, but uh, but ultimately, having that business to back up, you know, your if your music is good enough, then again, not perfect, but good enough. Then if you employ the right marketing tactics, you can get it out there, right? You can get well, out there from a lot of people. And those those tactics, I think, are per, they can be very overwhelming to somebody who's not done done much with that. I I know for me. The CRM or customer relationship management, essentially that's, I mean, for those that aren't familiar with that, it's it's this software that'll allow you to collect a name and an email. And um, I mean, you think about when you call your phone company or your cable company, they've tracked how many times you've called in and interacted and somebody's put a note in there. And just just the fact that if a, as a musician, if you collect that name, you know, having some notes about, okay, they bought this thing or they had a question about this or they interacted with me on Facebook messenger having a one stop shop is, is absolutely critical. And, and it's great that you build that list, but then the next biggest mistake I see people make is maybe they spent money on a software that can do some or most of that. And then they never get around to even messaging that they don't send text. They don't send a message out on Facebook. They don't send an email out. And, and as, as cool as it is to have a million views on a YouTube video or TikTok or whatever it is, there's no money there. I mean, it's, I mean, there's, there's a little bit, but it's not sustainable. And 
It's flash like in the with, pan. Yeah. I mean, just like with any business, unless you can get somebody to come back and uh, buy the thing again and again and again, or listen to your music again and again and again, there's there's no business there unless you have continuity in that. And I think that's a mistake a lot of musicians make is they think, oh, I've got, you know, I get up to 10,000 followers on Facebook. What do you do? Well, Facebook's going to make, you know, they're going to charge you money even to reach, you know, 95% of those people. They will never see your, you know, post that you do, even if, you know, even if you're paying for it sometimes. So, so uh, I met a musician um, that I want to share about because I think, I wish I had done what he did and I'm still young enough that I could probably, I could probably still take advantage and do this a little bit. But when he was young, this is a guy, I'm not going to share his name because, uh, because I don't have his permission to, and he's, he's quite a private individual, but a very, he's a Grammy winning musician out of Nashville. We'll say that, right. Narrows it down quite a bit right now. There's like a ton of people in Nashville, obviously that have dedicated their lives to music, but he said, you know what? I'm going to delay the gratification on buying the houses and buying the nice stuff. And I'm just going to do music and I'm going to be really good at it. He was, uh, he, he, he played, you know, piano and played some other things and, but then produced a lot. Uh, and he won his Grammy for, uh, for pr production. And, uh, but anyway, he's, he took all of his money. He lived like on the street if he had to, he just didn't care. He just needed to lay down on a couch and eat some food the next day. Um, but he took all of his money and he put it into real estate from, you know, early, from late teens, early twenties until now he's in his sixties. And this guy is a multi hundred millionaire at mm. this point. And did he make his money in his music? He made some, he made some, but out of his, let's say he's got $200 million, right? I don't know what the exact number is, but let's just say it is. I bet you one to 2 million of that was his music over his career. Right. Maybe a little more than that. Right. But ultimately just the style, what he did and, you know, the industry he was in, everybody's different, but, but he, he just bought a house and then he bought a second one. And then he, what he did is he built, he built that passive income. Cause one of the things that's really difficult as a musician is to build passive income. You have to have at least enough to, you know, most people, if they want to live a pretty comfortable life, need 20 to $30,000 a month of income, right? That's a 240 to a $360,000 salary our annual annual income and and that's you know that's comfortable right you're 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 making it up to be able to kind of do what you want right and provide the opportunities you have for your kids now you could still be much more successful than that but i think most people would be happy with that but how many song plays a month do you need to get 20 to 30 thousand dollars a month in your bank account it's a lot right yep. and even if you're doing selling piano books and things like that that are you know whatever if it's not completely digital and completely automated, then it's still not passive income. It's income. It's great, right? But you can't, it's hard to get to a point as a musician where you're like, I'm going to stop doing effort on the music and it's going to support me for the rest of my life. And so I think that finding something, whether it's real estate or some other home-based business or, you know, go work some job and make, you know, in sales or in whatever you want to do and live, you know, below your your income level and then invest it in those long-term things so that eventually you get to the point where by the time you're 35, 40, 45 years old, you don't have to work anymore unless you want to, but you can. I'm someone who I'm, I want to work. I enjoy it. I think it's fun. Um, and so, but, but ultimately um, it's not that hard to get up to 20 to $30,000 a month in passive income in real estate. If you focus on it from a young age, right? You buy your first house, you live in it for a year, you buy your next house, you have that one as a rental income property, and you just move your way up year over year. And yeah, that's a lot of work. You got to move. You got to spend time probably on your in your free time fixing up the house and getting it ready and and trying to improve it so that you can turn it into to rental income, whether that's an Airbnb or long-term rentals or whatever you want to do. But there's, uh, and again, that's one guy's way that he did it um, with real estate. He did commercial real estate. He did residential. He did it all. Um, but, uh, but understanding, yeah, understanding how the business world works, how to make money, how to quickly put together a company, how to quickly put together an ad campaign, how to, how to be able to, you know, do graphic design and video editing and all those little things that you don't have to be an expert at it, especially with all the tools today, they do a lot of the work for you. You just have to know how to put the right pieces in place. So you can quickly whip out in, you know, 10 seconds, uh, or 10 minutes, we'll say to be realistic of an album cover, 
um and uh or a you know just an itunes and apple music a spotify you know image that's going to show up on your album or your single or whatever it is um you just got to figure out how to do it quickly um so that you can you can diversify um diversify your time and and be efficient that's what i find i i really hate inefficiency because i don't have time to be inefficient and at the same time I don't have time to do everything that I want. And, um, and then I find myself, you know, watching six episodes of the office at night before I go to bed and say, <laughs> I don't have time, man. That's really, that's, that's, that's well, a little bit. I think, I mean, the numbers you're throwing out there, I think for a lot of people, those are huge numbers. And I think what's, as I've been around a lot of business owners and successful people, uh, there's something that's different with their mindset than, you know, in, in the numbers that they think, you know, that they even realize they can do. You know, for a lot of people, making a thousand dollars with their music would be, you know, life changing, and and the whole idea of like, oh my gosh, I could get to ten or twenty or thirty thousand a month. I mean, those, you know, there there are ways to do that, but I think you're spot on with, you know, don't necessarily just put all your eggs on the music basket. Um, yes, you can make money in there, but if you really want to grow that passive income, there's you're going to need to figure out how to do some other things and be okay with that and. And invest sometimes as much energy, if not more, into some of those other things, so that it'll open up the ability for you to to really spend time um, on your music later. I mean, that's that's my story for sure. I, you know, spent you know nearly twenty years in the banking and then the marketing, software development side, and and then got to this point. It's like, oh my gosh, now what am I going to do with myself? I sold my company, and um, it's a it's a weird place to be. And, and I'm in the same boat as you where I have fun working and helping others and serving and, and, you know, but it's different when you get to choose what you want to do for sure. And, and can, can then spend as much or as little time as you want to on that music. Uh, well, and it's nice also, I think to have the budget music stuff's expensive, right? Like oh, I've yeah. got, these, I've got these monitors you can see right here mm -hmm. and they're, they're Newman's I think. Yeah. And so each of these monitors is like 800, 900 bucks. Right. Yep. And, I mean, that's not like a crazy amount of money, but I've got one behind the, you know, video here. And and then I've got a six or seven thousand dollar, you know, computer, and another one sitting right over there. And I've got a keyboard here and I've got another keyboard here and, you know, all the nice inputs and mixing boards and and the real instruments that I've got. I've got five or six string instruments and I've played saxophone actually in jazz band back in the day. I've got a few woodwinds and, and buying the nice piano. Right. But all that adds up very, very fast. And oh, then yeah. I just. I don't know how much money you spent, but I've spent a huge amount of money on samples. I'm always like, buy the biggest package. And now I've got, you know, 64,000 instruments that I'll never use, but right. I've got them <laughs> on my, on all my recording programs. And so I found that I'm like, man, I really want that, that really nice soundboard that, you know, it's 3,600 bucks. And, you know, you just got to, it doesn't come out of, out of nowhere. Right. And so I found that by, by first focusing on business and, and it wasn't because I wanted all this fancy stuff. That's not why I did it. I actually did it because I wanted to be able to provide amazing experiences for my family, right? Which I know you care about too, Jason, with you know the things that you're that you're up to. Um, but that's what I, I I really wanted my family to be just be secure, right? And be mm -hmm. like, hey, we we can take care of ourselves. And then occasionally I'll say, hey, I've got enough money that I think I can spend a few thousand bucks or two thousand bucks on some new headphones or. That's the, that gets me really, really high quality so that when I do get to focus on on one of my passions, which is music, it's a really fun experience. And I have the right equipment and I'm not like, man, I wish I had this thing. I'm like, no, I've got it. I've got what I need. Do I know how to use it all really well? No, I'm still learning. I, but and, but I've got it. At least I at least I have the opportunity to learn it. Well, and that's I, I think the beauty of what's the way the music business is going now is a lot of I mean, yes, you can spend thousands of dollars, but but it's pretty low ticket. You know, it's not super expensive to get in and Getting have a, a good quality that if you mm -hmm. had them side by side and you knew how to use the basic stuff, you can compete with the guy that has the hundred thousand dollars worth of stuff in his, in his I agree. But they're fun. The gadgets are just, it fun. is fun. Absolutely. But I, but I agree like <laughs> East, like East West is what 30 bucks a month or whatever. And you've right. got, you get everything. <laughs> you have everything you need, at least from a sample perspective, you need a keyboard and you need some sort of da and you yep. are off to the races and you're right that's that's a couple hundred bucks all in <laughs> and you're and you're you're going well and i think as a as i look back on my path some some of the times when i feel like i've grown the most as a musician was when i was 
spending a lot of money in the studio to be, you know, to have the coaching, mentoring, the producer, you know, those experiences when you can have them will sometimes fast track you much more than if you were at home, just trying to figure it all out yourself and, you know, spending 10 or 20 years learning, you might be able to skip those 19 years and learn enough in that one year with working with some great people uh, so that now it's a game changer for your next year. So uh, yeah, I mean, it's, I think the cool thing is there's a, there's a path for everybody. I'm, I'm curious. Um, uh, I mean, the podcast is called the successful musicians podcast. When you hear the word successful musician, I mean, what does that mean to you? It's a great question. Um, and it comes back. I've been thinking about this actively for the last few days, as I read that the stats about Spotify, right? Like how do you really stand out? Um, when it comes down to it, I really have found more joy lately in my life in knowing that I helped the one. That's why I write music. I write music to bring peace and joy to other people's life. And, and for some reason, for the last few years, the time when I've had the most opera, the place I've had the most opportunity to play music is in church. Right. And I'm asked way more probably than I should be to play. Like every two months I'm up on stage and sometimes more than that, I'm playing this Sunday um, and, and I'm, you know, I'm, I always, I, I hate coming back to old stuff. So I'm always writing new, new things every single time I do that. But, but I'm always just, you know, I always go into those opportunities, whether it's at church or even not at church, right. I always, I always say a little prayer before I play. Um, and I just say, Hey, you know, help me, help me to touch somebody, right. There's just one person that, that just brings them some hope or makes them a little happier or, you know, brings a tear to their eye because they felt something that uh, made them a little happier or helped relieve something that that's, that's what I want. And every single time, 100% of the times that I have gotten up in front of people and played, I've had people come up to me and say, Hey, that, um, that really helped me. Thank you for sharing that. Or, you know, and I hear just little things like that. And those are the moments that make me feel like I'm successful. Honestly, I have, I have enough money that I don't need to make money with my music. Right. Um, doesn't mean I don't mind making money with my music and I'm excited when my Spotify check is a little bigger that month or my app music, you know, my streaming things. Um, and I'm like, Oh, Hey, a lot of people listen to my music, but it's, it's not the few hundred dollars or a thousand dollars, maybe sometimes, and sometimes $47, right. That comes in and you're like, Hey, cool. There's a little bit more money in my checking account. I actually don't care. I actually, I'm like, I immediately translate that dollar into how many people instantly. That's what I care about is how many people enjoyed my music in their home. Right. I had, I came out with a really cool little EP for Christmas a couple years ago and I worked really hard on just these four songs and I put them out and they got on, you know, they got onto some, one of those playlists. Right. And uh, you know, that everybody listens to, and it got, it got played like three or 400,000 times. I don't remember what the exact number was, but during the Christmas season, that was a lot. And so for me, I was just like, man, that is awesome. Hundreds of thousands of homes felt the Christmas spirit a little bit more because of the work that I did. And so for me, that's the successful musician. It's, it's being able to, um, you know, play and uh, compose and create in a way that makes someone else's life better. If yeah. that's, if that's accomplished, then I'm happy. I, I love that. I, I, and as I look back on all of the, I mean, the millions and millions of song plays or hundred millions, whatever it is, I, I think if you ask me when it meant the most, it's, I've, you know, there's probably that dozen or so emails and, and yeah. I've been really fortunate to get, I mean, I get lots of emails or messages and I love every single one of them, but there's some that, I mean, they, they hit you hard, you know, uh, somebody that, I mean, I, when you have somebody, for example, that, you know, they were contemplating suicide and they'll yeah. reach out months later and say, Hey, your music helped me with that. Or, you know, I've, I've had, um, you know, when you, when you and I both have kind of this relaxing piano vibe going on, but I can't tell you how many people I've had tell me that, you know, Hey, my, my, my mom or my dad was listening to you, had your CD playing and it, I had one that they said that the CD finished and it was the last breath and that was the end. You know, and they just said it was so calming and and made such a difference. And and those those types of things that, you know, whether you believe in a higher power or not, I mean, I, I there I gotta 
think that, you know, most people believe that there's some sort of spiritual side, you know, however you understand that to be with music and how that interacts. But um, it's definitely cool when you can kind of connect at that level and, and help just that, even that one person, I mean, that maybe that's all that it needed to be is, you know, who cares about any of the dollar signs, right? Yeah. The dollar signs really fade away. They really fade away fast. Um, especially if you've taken a route like your your meet that where we where we kind of focused on business first and then music, we get to kind of do what we want and we don't have to have somebody telling us what to do, right? right. Kind of back to what I was saying in the beginning, we got to really focus on that. But I think the best compliment that I've gotten many times, I've probably gotten it ten times, but to have the same comment ten times means there's probably a pattern there, right? And and it's that my music is really good at reducing road rage. <laughs> <laughs> they just turn it on and they're just calm and peaceful driving down the road, right? And um, and again, you know, I I've, I've received. I don't think I've ever had anybody say, "Hey, your music saved me from or saved my life," but or saved my life in that way, that that directly. But I've had people reach out and say, "Hey, me and my me and my daughter love listening to this, and and she plays your music, and and I love it too, and it just kind of bonds us and." Thank you for sharing. You know, those little things make a difference. That's the that's the reason, oh. right? If I can write a ton more music and just get a few messages like that every year, I'll keep writing. Well, and and I, I think every time I do a song, you, you just, I don't know, there's something that you just feel a little bit of fulfillment and knowing that there's actually mm-hmm. something that may carry on longer than, you know, our short time here Yeah, while we're here. So uh, you never know when it's going to be, be the end. And, you know, the fact so I was that- sitting... I was sitting in um, a concert by uh, or with Alan Menken uh, down at Tuacon in St. George um, a couple years ago, maybe. And one of the best concerts I've ever been to was just him at a piano with no agenda, really. And just, hey, I'm just he's just going to talk and share stories and, you know, play a couple things here and there to just kind of illustrate something. He wasn't even really like performing. He was just like, oh, here was an idea. And he'd like show it and then he'd just talk about it. Right. Whatever. But. But then he'd play some of those things and there'd be a movie or thing that would go on. And and I I, I would I'd look around the room, you know, two of not a huge, I don't know how many people fit in there, 3,000, 2,000. I'm not sure how many people fit in that venue, but 100% of everybody in that room, in that venue, that's not a room, it's outdoor, in the amphitheater, knew every word to every one of his songs, mm-hmm. right? And I was thinking while I was doing that, brought tears to my eyes thinking, this guy... And I know he had lots of people help him, but let's just say him for the for this argument's sake. He could go into almost any room in the world and have the same result. There, there's probably over a billion people that know all of his music, or at least some of his music, one of his songs, Beauty and the Beast, Part of Your World, you know, whatever it is, right? I mean, some of these songs that are just, the, the, the world has kind of grown up on and what you know, made animated movies and, and different things, what they are today. Um, but man, yeah, you, you're mentioning like, well, could we just write a song that carries on, right? Or Kurt Bester, he loves it. His best song is not Prayer of the Children. He's got lots of really cool stuff, but somehow that one just, you know, went out mm-hmm. there and everybody, every choir in the world knows it. And he always talks about how that's his, that's his like, jewel that's the one he really cares about because so many people know it so it's touched so many hearts um but he wrote it in like on afternoon you know it was just one of those things that just happened he was playing around with one of his cool new gadgets mm-hmm. uh, talked to him about it a few years ago and, and it just kind of popped out um but it's interesting music is powerful it can it can make a it can make such a massive impact with uh with such a small thing and uh Anyway, I was I was impressed. Jealous is the wrong word, but but it's you know, I that's that's what I aspire towards, right? Is you know, with my music, can I write something that that gets out there and and brings feelings? Usually, for most people, I would imagine of happiness when they hear a song like that. Um, that music brings back memories. I think I think that's why it's so powerful, yeah. right? You hear you hear a song, and I can hear some yellow card song or something from you know back when i was in high school or something and boom i'm instantly back in the car going to school with my friends and you know i just remember all those things like i'm right there and i think music can bring back those tender sweet memories um and uh so yeah that's what that's what motivates me is to just bring those moments of peace and joy 
to people that listen. Yeah. Well, I know we're about out of time. Last question for you. What um, you've probably had lots of advice and mentors over the years. If you can think back to kind of one, is there any one specific moment or one piece of advice somebody maybe gave you along the way that you feel like has has helped you really with your music and I, I guess just life in general? Yeah. Um, the person that's coming to mind, and I don't know if this is what you're looking for here, but his name is Dave Fulmer. And he was the jazz band teacher at Timpview High School. Uh, for years and he, his jazz program was one of the best in the state for many 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 years while he was doing that actively he's now down at snow college um but i just remember him expecting more from me he's like john i know you can play but but you're missing some of these things here and if you just spend a little bit of time focusing on these things you'd fill in and you'd you know this is when i'm like 16 years old, right? No, 15, 15, 16 years old. It's kind of right before I started composing, actually. So it might have been him that really kind of pushed me out of my cocoon uh, to say, but um, there were a lot of technical things because I had only had a teacher for a few years, right? And then I got to be really good without a lot of structure, um, just kind of my own thing. And then, and then I was the second pianist and, you know, the first one was a senior and I was a I think I was a freshman at that. No, no, no. I was a, I was a sophomore at the time at Tempe high school. And, uh, I knew I was better than the first chair pianist. Like I could play the piano better. I could play harder things, cooler things, whatever, but she was technically more proficient. And he, he wanted me to fill in those gaps. He wanted me to fill in and be like, Hey, there's things that she can do better than you that are going to be useful. And if you understood them and then applied them to, to what you're doing, you're going to be just incredible. And then I buckled down and for like two months, I just practiced like crazy, every technical thing I could get my hands on that would, that would improve the things we were talking about. And it was just a bunch of like dexterity with scales and, and really knowing, knowing how to do the scales in different chord progressions that were, really tough mind brain exercises for me at the time. And then they just became second nature, right? I could just like, I could still do them today. I could think I tell you, I could walk them, walk you through them right now. But, um, but yeah, just that, I think, I think Dave Fulmer expecting, expecting a lot more for me saying, Hey, I know you're not living up to your full potential. That's always been a problem for me. I've always found things to be easy for me when I was in, in elementary school, middle school, high school, I could put my bare minimum effort in and get A's. I was just like, yeah, here it is. I just I catch things quickly. And that's a curse. It was a curse for me. And my son has the standings brilliant. Um, and so he just doesn't try very hard. And that's a bad habit to get into because when you get it easily, then you, you just, you don't get that joy of really trying hard. And, and then when you do work hard, you get this extra, extra awesome, awesome result. And so I think, I think that was kind of a turning point for me where I started pushing a little harder, um, especially in piano, right. To say, Hey, maybe I, maybe I am good. And, and I think, I think, um, part of it too, is having people in your life that cheer you on your cheerleaders are important. They're, they're critical. And he was a, he was a teacher and critical, but also he saw something in me. He's like, Hey, just, you got to go hard. And so he pushed on me, pushed on me, pushed on me. And by the time I was done with him, we had a great relationship and I ended up being in first chair eventually, which was awesome. great. Was but, awesome. uh, but yeah, Dave was, Dave was the guy push harder, be don't, don't settle for just because you're good at it without trying push, push yourself. Everybody's limit is different, but if you push yourself to the limit, you're going to find really cool stuff. It's amazing. I, I think having people, I mean, it's, one of the things is, as you're explaining that, uh, as if I look at myself, um, had somebody probably pushed me, I'm not sure. I think different people respond differently to the pushing back. And and I think there's sometimes a maturity level that we may or may not have until we get older in life where you realize, yeah. oh my gosh, that person was actually trying to help me. And sometimes, you know, as I've, I've been around other people, sometimes they take the feedback or the criticism as a, you know, as a negative and they're like, Oh, they think I'm terrible or, you know, I can't do this. And, and I, th I think the limiting beliefs and that mindset that you have 
and, and trying to grow when somebody gives you that feedback and learning from it is that's a skill that I think every musician ought to have, but I think it applies to probably it applies to the business side of, you know, a lot of times people say, Oh, I can't do the business side. I just do, I just play the instrument. Um, it's probably a perfect example of, okay, wait a minute. If you step back and look at the big picture, if you want to be more successful with your music, maybe you need to to branch out and, and learn some of the business side so you can be successful, more successful with the music. So great, great yeah, I'll advice. Say, I'll say one other thing that this isn't something that I heard or maybe I did somewhere, but as far as I know, it just kind of came out of my brain. Um, and, and this applies more to the, more to the business side, but certainly applies to, to music and everything as well. Um, I have a lot of people. I've, I've raised capital from a lot of people. And that's a scary thing to do um, because now you're playing with other people's money. And and uh, at least, you know, some people just kind of lose it and whatever. Maybe they don't feel bad. Maybe they feel bad. But I personally, as a sense of honor and duty, I'm not going to lose those people's money, right? So I listen to them, right? But raising capital from over 50 different individuals and groups and whatever, um, all of them have different opinions. <laughs> they all think it should be done one way. And one person says this and, hey, if you do this, I'll invest more money and whatever. Um, I think I think something that really matters for music, for business, for whatever, is to really just, you can take that input from whoever, whether you respect the input or not, and then you decide what to do with it. You have to decide what you believe and go and do that thing, right? I had people, it, it, it's just like with anything in life, right? You get online and you say, is bread good for you? <laughs> and you'll find 50% of people saying it's good for you and 50% saying stay away from gluten, whatever, right? And, and you know, we could go on that with caffeine or with wine. And I'm just talking about food related things. You can find answers all over the place. And, and it's no different in business or even in music or in how you should do it. There's all these ideas and everybody thinks they're right. And maybe in the right context, they're all right. Um, and so with all of that, with that complexity and so many voices out there, you really have to sit down and say, what do I believe? Why am I running this business? What is the core problem that I'm trying to tackle here? How do I want to run this business? How do I want to treat the people that work with me? Um, you know, do I want to, you know, squeeze every ounce of, 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 uh, you know, value out of this person and pay them as little as possible? Or do I want to pay them enough money so that they don't have to worry about money and they don't have to go get a side hustle and they can focus completely on what I'm doing, right? And I can find people that will tell you both of those things are the right way to do it. Um, ultimately, you take all this stuff that we're, you know, that Jason and I have been saying for the last however long here and and then make your own choice. You're you're the best equipped to make that, that decision. Um, take all the input and ideas you can get but um, but if you feel something, if you feel like you should do something, or if you feel like, man, this song is just awesome and I love it the way it is and and I need to get it out there, then don't don't not do that. <laughs> That's a double negative, right? Don't stop. Don't don't let anything get in your way. Things will get in your way. Especially if, as Jason was talking about earlier, I do believe that there is a higher power. And I believe that when we find something really good and we want to share it with the world that there are also forces and powers that don't want you to, to share that with the world. And, uh, and if you push past those doubts, um, you're walking when you're, when you're out there publishing and starting businesses and creating, when you're creating, that is the road less traveled and it's lonely and it's difficult and it's not well lit and sunny and nice. And, you know, the road well traveled is, you know, it's paved and nice and there's tons of people there. It's crowded, but, you're safe, right? But when you venture off that path and you say, I'm going to go create something big, um, whether that's a symphony or a three minute song, it's your first song that you're putting up on Spotify, um, or you're going to start a business or whatever it is you're doing. Um, focus, focus in here, really pay attention to what you think, use the inputs, don't ignore other people. They might be smart, um, they might be idiots, but you have to decipher that. You have to decipher all that information and say, hey, what is what is best for me? And I've found that that's helped me get where I am today is just knowing what I believe very firmly and and then um, you know, respectfully listening to all opinions. And I love listening to other people's opinions. I love, I love looking for blind spots. And then I let it all kind of calculate and then 
I've got a better plan to go ahead. I'm smarter because I've thought about it and I've, I've given time to, to let it just ruminate in my head and do its stuff. So anyway. Awesome. Well, well, John, if people want to be able to decrease their road rage and, and listen to some of your music, where should they go? Yeah. Uh, good, good question. So yeah. Um, my, my music, I, I update my site, like, I don't know, on average, probably once a year, <laughs> I should do it more than that. Um, I've got some stuff coming up. I'll be updating on there. I just threw a couple new songs, but yeah, John Cheney.com. It's J O N Cheney, C H E N E Y.com. John Cheney.com. And, uh, and then, yeah, if you want to connect with me for business purposes or for, you know, advice, or you just want to see what I post, I post every day on LinkedIn. That's my main, that's my main kind of platform is LinkedIn. So, um, feel free to follow me there, connect with me on there. I'm happy to, happy to chat. Awesome. Well, John, thank, thanks so much for your, for your time. And we're going to put all those links in the show notes as well. So if you're coming back to them, you can click and find those real easy, but appreciate you sharing those words of wisdom. And uh, I think a lot of people are going to benefit from what you shared today. Thanks, Jason.